friends. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Pixie Sticks. Thank you for choosing to spend some of your time with me today. Today I am going to do something that I've been promising to do for a while. A few people have asked me to do a tutorial on how I do digital art. So that's what I'll be doing today is a small tutorial on how I do my digital art, my entire process from start to finish on like a chibi. So hopefully that helps some of you. I'm going to give some tips along the way. If there's anything in this video that I don't cover that you have questions about, please feel free to let me know in a comment and I would be happy to do a follow-up video. Let's get into the drawing. Okay, so the first thing to mention is probably the program that I'm using, Paint Tool SAI version 2. I don't know how to say that officially. I always call it Paint Tool Sci. I've heard it several different ways, but that's not important. Anyway, what is important is most of the tips I'm showing you today can be done in any drawing program. This is just the one that I personally like, and I will tell you the reasons why I tend to use it, especially for lined artwork. So the first thing that you need to figure out is how to set up your canvas for the art you're going to do. So if I go to File, New, it brings up this little Options screen. So I can go ahead and give this a file name right here, and I'm going to call it Digital Step by Step. And it's got some presets that you can choose from, but I typically do custom. And my default is 3000 pixels by 3300 pixels, so it's a portrait that's just a little bit taller than it is wide. Usually what I'm drawing is stickers or busts of characters or full body characters, and these sizes should work just fine for all of those. I set the printing resolution to 300, because that'll make sure if I ever do want to print these, especially with stickers and things, that they will be nice quality printed. And then I typically set the background to transparency, but one of the things I like about Paint Tool Sci is you can set it to transparency color which means that there are no pixels behind your layer, but it still shows a color in the background. And I typically choose kind of a light gray, such as this one. That way it's easier to tell how much contrast you actually have going on in your piece, because colors next to each other can look different than they do standalone. So making sure the background is kind of a mid-tone helps you choose your lights and your darks more accurately. You can still have a background like this in Photoshop. You just have to place a layer of color underneath the layer you want to work on. The reason I like the way Paint Tool Side does it is because if I go ahead and click OK here, you'll see that I'm on layer one. But if I turn off layer one, you can still see that background which means there's only one layer, and anything I draw on this layer is transparent. So if I create another layer under this and take a different color and go under it, you can see it's transparent, but I still get that colored background and I don't have to fool around with locking a background layer or remembering to hide the background layer if I want a transparent PNG at the end. So yeah, this is just one thing I like about Paint Tool Sci. So now we're left with our canvas here, and as you can see, if I hold spacebar, I get this little hand cursor, which can move the canvas around as I please. I highly recommend getting familiar with whatever keyboard shortcuts or tablet shortcut buttons that you have available to you. Some of them are pretty standard to most drawing programs. The spacebar move tool is a pretty standard one. Control Z is very standard for undo. Also, if you hold Control or I guess Command if you're on a Mac and hit the plus button, you can zoom in and Control minus will zoom out. So those are all very standard. Okay, now that you have your canvas, the very first thing you should do is save it. <laughs> you can either go to file and save or hit control S. Both will do the same thing. Save your file <laughs> and then hit control S often as you're working because the worst thing is when you've done a whole bunch of work on your artwork and something happens, your computer crashes, your art program crashes and you lose it all. For paint tool side two, that doesn't happen a whole lot. 
and it also has a nice recovery feature, which I appreciate. So I haven't really lost a lot of work in this program, but that all depends on your computer and the program itself. So I always recommend the first thing you do after you open a new Canvas is to save it and then save often afterwards. <laughs> The next thing I typically do when I'm getting ready to work on my illustration is I place my references directly onto my canvas and that's one of the advantages of having a large canvas like this is that I've got space to place things and space to draw next to those things. So let's do that next. I guess that means I should figure out what I'm going to draw. <laughs> so this is a Trello board where I host and track all of the avatars belonging to my patrons. What I'd like to do is randomly choose one of these to draw today. So let's get a random number generator and we'll start here with one and then we'll go down and then start here and go down. So let's go ahead. I know there are 15. All right, so we're on a random number generator. So we've got one to 15, let's generate a number. Three. That's easy. One, two, and three. Okay, so we'll be drawing Mini Bean today. So I just went ahead and saved it to my computer and now I can open it here. It comes up in a separate document. I can Control A to select all, Control C to copy, and Control V to paste it. And here's my ref. Now I can move her around anywhere, but I'm going to keep her kind of up in this top corner and then I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that I can see her and have room to draw here on the side. As you can see, Paint Tool Sci has a navigator built in, which is nice. You can even change the scale from here. I just tend to use my mouse wheel or control plus and minus. So now that I've got this here, it's time to go ahead and start sketching. I've got her on a separate layer, so I'm going to go down here to layer one, which is empty, and that's where I'm going to sketch. And then that way we keep the two layers independent of each other and we can move them around separately. So when I'm sketching, I tend to like to use kind of a bright color. Usually it's like teal or pink or something like that, just so I can easily see later which lines are my sketch lines and draw over them more easily. When I am sketching, this is personal preference, but I like to use this brush it's kind of like a, just the pen tool, but it has a little bit more transparency on it. If I press harder, it's more opaque. And then if I press lighter, you can see it kind of going over itself there. So I really prefer that for sketching. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm probably just going to do a bust. I don't know that I'll talk exactly about how I draw people, because this is more about how to use the program. So. I'll just start sketching here and then we'll move on from there. Sing, won't you sing with me? Leave everything for me. Stay the night. Oh, miss your flight. Walk through the rain with me. Get soaked to the skin, feel free. One thing I do suggest you do somewhat regularly when you're sketching is to flip the canvas. And Sai makes this easy by having this little flip button up here. This kind of resets your eyes. So <laughs> if you're drawing something this way and you're just going along, you might not realize that something looks a little bit off. And then when you flip the camera, you'll see, oh yeah, there's some things I need to fix. It just kind of gives you a reset and lets you look at things from a clearer perspective. So as I'm going along here, I'm cleaning up some of the lines that I have decided aren't what I want. And this just helps me kind of make sense of my sketch a little bit more. I'm trying to start out with really simple shapes that I plan to go back in later to refine. So my first sketch pass is just trying to get everything placed where I want it, basically.
One of the things I love most about digital art is the ability to change things after you've laid it down without having to completely redraw it. So one of the ways that I do that, for instance, I think this elbow is too far down. I can go over here to this lasso tool and select the part that I want to move like this. And then I just hit control T and this lets me freely move that part around anywhere without messing with anything else on the canvas. I can also resize it, which makes it a lot easier for me to get things in proportion, because I'm really bad at that usually. <laughs> Okay, now that we have our basic sketch down, I'm gonna go ahead and lower the transparency of this even more. I don't currently need my reference because I've got her sketched out and the line work doesn't need the reference, so I'm gonna hide that. And what I like to do at this point, because I will be zooming in quite a bit, I wanna make sure I can see how the overall image looks together, but my eyes definitely need to be able to zoom in to see what I'm doing. So in order to get the best of both worlds here, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and go to View, a New Floating View, and this creates a floating window that's the same canvas as the one I'm currently working on. So if I make this smaller, and then I make a mark here, you'll see that mark also shows up over here and vice versa. And what this allows me to do is I can zoom in over here and start lining or whatever I'm gonna do. And this one stays at the full size so I can easily see the overall picture. You can see that the navigation window also kind of provides this, but it's a lot smaller and it's got this black mark to show where you're currently looking and it kind of covers things up. So I like to use this extra floating view instead. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about lining your artwork. So a lot of people start off in a way that I think might be making things harder on yourself. One of the great things about having a tablet is that it's got pen pressure. So here we go, let's show some of this. If I'm pressing really hard, we get a thick line and then the lighter I press, the thinner the line gets. So that's great for line weight, but it takes a lot of control and it takes a lot of practice to get used to. It's kind of like a brush pen in real life, like a real brush pen with bristles. <laughs> Those are harder to control than, say, a fine liner that has one single weight that you just put down. Basically, all of this is to say that you don't have to start off lining like this. As you can see, if you don't do it right, it looks really kind of haphazard. So one of the things that I tend to do is instead of using a pen tool with pressure, I use this marker tool. The variation in line width is a lot less extreme than when I use the pen tool. And this could be made less extreme too if I made the pen tool smaller and then it's easier to control. But then you wind up with really fine lines and depending on the look you're going for, that could be not what you want. So. What I tend to do is I pick this marker tool. Another thing I do before I start lining is I check my stabilizer. This is another reason when I started digital art that I decided to use Paint Tool Sci over Photoshop. I did not have a version of Photoshop that had a stabilizer. Only the newer CC versions do that. And what the stabilizer does is if I set it at zero and slowly draw a line, 
you can kind of see how wiggly it is. If I set it to S7 and slowly draw a line, do you see how far that lags behind? It does that so that the line is much, much straighter. It just allows you to easily create smooth line work. If I tried to do that with zero, it's just a lot more jaggedy. I usually keep this around S1 so it's not so laggy like S7, but it is definitely smoother. When I started off drawing digitally, I would keep this at S7 for my line work because my hands are very shaky and I wasn't used to it. And then I've gradually started to decrease the amount of stabilization as I start to work faster and more confident with my strokes. So that's something that you can do also if you feel unsure about your ability to <laughs> keep your lines smooth. Okay, so now we've set our stabilization and we've chosen our brush. So we can go ahead and start lining. And it doesn't really matter what you choose to start with, but what you do want to do is make sure that you make one long stroke versus trying to do it like this, because one long stroke will give you a much better, smoother line. I always have my hand on my control Z button or you can go up here to undo but I find that slower because I have to move my drawing hand back and forth so I use my keyboard and if the line doesn't come out the way I like it the first time I just undo it until I like the way it looks and it is perfectly okay to do that as many times as you feel you need Another good reason to use a brush that doesn't have too much pen pressure is when you leave off like this but you still need to continue this side of the face, it's a lot easier to match up this line with the next part of your line because your brush is going to be the same size. Now when you're doing something that does require a sharp point, you can still continue to use this brush. For instance in the hair here, what I'm going to go ahead and do is go back and just use my eraser to make this into a sharp point. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever tried calligraphy, but I'm not very good at calligraphy. So when I want to write fancy, I do what they call false calligraphy, where I draw the letter normally first and then I go back in and I add the weight where the weight should be. This is kind of like that except you're taking away the roundedness of the points that your brush has made because it has less pen pressure. My eraser has lots of pen pressure. I can do a thick erasing line or a thin one. And that is what helps me really fine tune the edges of this line. This can take a little while, but for me, it's what helps me get that really clean line work that I like. And as you can see, once you're used to it, it doesn't take all that long. Especially since in Paint Tool Sci, you're able to set different keyboard shortcuts for different brushes. So I have a keyboard shortcut for my marker tool, one for my pen tool, one for my eraser. So all I have to do is push a button and I can easily switch between all of those. And that's something, for instance, in Photoshop you can't do. There's a shortcut to cycle through all the brushes one by one, but you can't just easily set different brush types to different keyboard shortcuts. I'm not sure if that's something you can do in Clip Studio Paint. Um, so far, I've only found you can do it with Paint Tool Sci, and that's one of the reasons I use it pretty much exclusively when I'm doing line work it really speeds up my process.
Okay, at this point, the line work is done. I am going to delete my sketch because I no longer need that. And now we're left with our clean line work and it's time to do the next step. I'm gonna take this tool, which is the magic wand tool. I'm going to be on my line work layer, which I have now merged onto one layer. And I'm gonna click anywhere outside this layer. And as you can see, it selects everything except the inside of what I've drawn. Now, sometimes if you have drawn little divots like this, sometimes the selection won't reach all the way to the inside here, but it looks like it's done a pretty good job this time. I'm just gonna go around and kind of check because we don't want any white space. Oop. Okay. So I've selected the outside of our character. And now I'm going to go up to selection and invert selection. And now everything on the inside of the character is selected. So now it's time to create a new layer underneath our line layer over here. Take our bucket tool. I'm going to set this to gray for right now and just go ahead and fill it. Then if you control D to deselect, you'll see that you have filled in just the character. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to hold Alt to color pick, click on the skin color of our character. Then we're gonna come over here and lock this layer. And then we're gonna fill this with that color. Next, we're gonna create a new layer. We're gonna come over here to clipping group and click that. And basically what this does is it allows us to be coloring on a new layer above the other one, but still anything that we draw on this layer is going to be confined to the pixel area of the layer below it. So we can't color outside the lines basically. Now I'm going to go back to the line art layer. I'm going to grab my magic wand tool again. And I'm going to just start with, let's start with her shirt. So I'm going to click anywhere where her shirt is, the undershirt. I'm going to check and make sure I got most everything. I can also use this select pen to easily select more area. There's also select erase, which erases the selection. This is another reason I really like paint tool sci, because it's easy to see where you selected. And we're not going to invert it this time because this is what we're actually coloring. Come over here, hold alt, grab our blue color for the shirt. Come back here and fill the section. Now in Paint Tool Sci, you could use the bucket tool, but I've also set a shortcut, which is Control F for fill, and it just fills whatever you have selected, which I really like. So that's our shirt done. Now we're gonna do this for the rest of the individual pieces of this character. Now all that's left is the eyes and I'm going to go ahead and do this freehand because, as you can see, I haven't used lines all the way around her eyes because it looks a little too harsh and weird when I do that. So I'm just going to use my pen tool on a new layer above the skin layer. Grab the eyeball color. <laughs> and I'm going to make my brush a tiny bit bigger because it'll be easier, I think. Then I'm just going to kind of find my way here. This is something that doesn't have to be perfect right away. Little by little carve out the circle that you want the eye to be. Okay, and then we'll do that for the other eye. Okay, and if I like how that looks, I'll move on to the next step, which is the pupils. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer above our eye whites. <laughs> and then I'll just grab my magic selection tool again, come up to line art layer, grab those eyeballs, and sample the color and fill them in. I'm gonna go ahead and do her pupils too. And I tend to do those on another layer in case I have to move them around because for some reason, for me, 
pupils are really hard to get right. <laughs> like they, they start out looking kind of weird until I can figure out where I want to place them. <laughs> yeah, see, they look real crazy there. I'm going to select all that. I'm going to hit delete. <laughs> and I'm going to try again. Okay, so this is where I'm going to grab this, use my little move tool here, and just kind of move it around till it's where I think it looks right. And that is why I put it on a separate layer. <laughs> the next part might be my favorite part when we're drawing a character, and that is to add the little blushies. <laughs> I think it really just makes the skin co come alive. And this is also where I get to show you one of my favorite tools in Paint Tool Sci. So, on our new layer above the skin, below everything else, now I'm going to put blushies on her cheeks, her ears, the place where her nose would be if I drew noses on chibis, <laughs> and her fingertips. Basically anywhere where blood would probably be close to the surface. And then there's a couple of ways that I can blend this out. I can go up to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur, and blur it out that way, which works just fine. But it does tend to blur the fingers a lot more than these other places because it's a smaller area. So I prefer to do it manually. And what I use to do that is this brush right here that's called Watercolor. This is probably my favorite tool in Paint Tool Sci because it just so effortlessly blends things out. So we've got our color laid down on a layer above the skin and we can come in here and just gently brush along it and look how perfectly it smooths that edge out. It's like creating a gradient without the gradient tool. I love it. So we're going to do that around all the edges of all the blushies. And I can adjust my brush size if it's too big and it's erasing too much of our blush color. So that's the advantage it has over the Gaussian blur. The next thing that I tend to do is do kind of a gradient layer on the hair. So for this one, I am going to go ahead and just lock the layer that the hair is on because it's easier. And I'm going to grab this lighter color here in the middle. I'm going to make my pen tool a little bit bigger. I'm just going to kind of touch on the very tips of her hair here and maybe the very tops of her little buns. And then I'm going to go ahead and Use my watercolor tool again. Just blend it out. And then I'm going to take a darker color and put that just wherever it's closer to her roots because it looks more natural. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be too clean with this because I'm going to blend it out anyway. So just quickly go along the places I think it would be. And then use my watercolor tool to blend it out. And it just adds a little bit of dimension to the hair before you even get to the shading and lighting part of the drawing. The next step that I typically do is to color the line work and as you can see if you zoom in on the reference all of this line work is colored and i just feel like it makes it look a little bit softer so in order to do that i'm going to take the color of line work that's probably going to cover most of the lines in here because that'll be the easiest which is probably this brown for the hair and i'm going to go up to my line work layer create a new layer above that set another clipping group so we're only affecting the lines and this is going to look a little weird but i'm going to control f to fill all the lines so as you can see it's turned everything on the line art layer the color of the hair lines but that's okay 
because now we can create a new layer above that, set that to clipping group, and just come over and pick out the colors we want for everything else and just color those in. Okay, now all our lines are colored and believe it or not, the only thing left is some quick shading. This is definitely my more chibi style, which means it's not as detailed as my normal illustration style, but it definitely is a little bit easier and quicker. So let's go ahead and start on the next step, which is, you guessed it, creating a new layer. And this one's gonna be clipped to the layer that all the flat colors are clipped to. So just put it on top, all the flat colors and make a clipping mask. And we're gonna turn it to multiply. And the reason we do that, turn it to multiply. Let's turn it to normal first. We could shade this with say some gray or whatever. Let's just put that down and then lower the opacity of that layer. But maybe you can tell it looks a little washed out. If we turn that back up to normal and then hit multiply, it kind of deepens the color. But something about it still looks kind of off, right? For one thing, it's too dark. So let's, let's do this. Skin is alive, and this gray that we're using kind of makes her look a little bit dirty or dead. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to a cooler version of her skin tone. So she's got, you know, up here in the peachy tones. Let's go to a pink and kind of a lighter version of pink, but let's see what that does when we put it down. Ah, okay. So it's still cool shading, but it looks a lot more vibrant than gray would. And here's what this color looks like if it's on normal. It's kind of a light purple. And if we tried to just lower the opacity of this layer, it almost disappears. So that's why the multiply layer mode helps so much. <laughs> so then you just start shading and basically I'm going to stick on this one layer for all my shading here and then we'll move to the next step. So everything you see me doing right now is just going to be on that same multiply layer with that same color. So for this drawing, the light I imagine is coming from this direction. So it's kind of hitting her from like the top right. So I'm keeping that in mind as I'm placing the shadows. You can also use shadows to help Kind of mark out where some of the hair pieces are and how some are kind of blocking the light from the other pieces of hair. Like this section here kind of sticks up and casts a shadow here on this lower section, for instance. Okay, so that is basic flat shading, but for me, it still looks a little too harsh, especially like on her face here and on her cardigan, which should be a little bit softer since it's fabric. So here's a trick that I like to do when I'm doing shading of things like that, which also indicates kind of a, a rim light. So this is a little cheat that I use without actually having to put a rim light. So the first thing, we'll, we'll do her cheek here. The first thing I do is I go ahead and erase just a little sliver between the shadow and the line of her cheek. And I do this wherever 
the side of the shadow is. So like the lights on this side, so I'm doing this on the other side. So that's the first step. Just come through here and kind of do this. And then step two, we're back to our water tool again. We're making it a little bit smaller. We don't want the water tool to come up to the left side of this. It's only gonna affect the right side where the light is coming from. And we're just gonna softly blend out that edge. And then we'll do the same here on the jacket. But we leave that hard edge in the bottom. And what that ends up doing, you can see, is when you look at it zoomed out, it looks a little bit like there's a bounce light down there and here. Now, another thing you can do if you want to kind of play with the contrast of your shadow, if you don't think it's dark enough or you think it's too dark, you can go to Filter, Color Adjustments, Hue, Saturation. You can try to adjust the saturation. Ooh, really pink or really gray. Ooh, now we're back to that dead looking look. You can adjust the luminance. So if we bring it up, the shadow kind of gets lighter. And if we bring it down, we get darker. <laughs> That's crazy looking. Okay, so I'm gonna up the saturation a little bit. And then I might play with the hue and see if I like it more on the purple end or more on the like reddish end. And I think I like it there. Now, my current color I have selected no longer matches the shading color. So now if I wanna go back in and do more shading, you'll see it doesn't match. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this to normal so I can color pick our new shading color. And then back to multiply. And now anything that I shade will be the color of our edited shading. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish up with these fingers. A little bit of shade in the corners of the mouth, inside the eyeball. And now it's time for the lighting layer. <laughs> so one more layer, clipping group, and then we're gonna go up to screen for this one. And I'm gonna grab this black here for the eyes because I'm going to start with the eyes. I'm going to kind of bring it down a little bit into the brown and see if I like this. And I think it's a little too light. But if we go ahead and move it darker and then lock our layer and control F, we can adjust that. Then we unlock the layer. Then I'm going to go back in with my favorite watercolor brush and just kind of blend that out a little. And this just gives the eyeball some depth because the light is shining in on it and causing brightness there. Okay. Then I'm going to put some shine in her hair. So I just color picked the color of her hair. And I'm going in with that in kind of an H shape in the spots where the light would be hitting. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is just kind of blend out the top of each one of those. Okay, now as you can see, it is kind of overpowering here. So what I'd like to do is move it to its own layer so that I can independently adjust the opacity of this without affecting what I've done in the eyes. And luckily that's easy to do. I'm actually gonna just move the eyes to their own layer. So I'm gonna select those. And this is just selecting this highlight we've done because everything else is on a different layer. I'm gonna control X. Control V to paste, clipping group, and then back to screen. And then they're on their own layer, and I can go back to this layer with the hair shinies and just lower the opacity quite a bit just to make it a little bit less in your face. <laughs> and with that opacity lowered, I think I'll actually add 
a bit of lightness to the fabric of her sweater. And I'm actually going to do this with that watercolor tool because I just want a little bit of a light effect and I'm going to blend it out anyway. So that's what I'm going to start it with. And this is just helping it look more like it has volume and shape. And now I want to go back to some of the shading on the face and just smooth it out a little bit like especially around the eyes, which gives her a softer look. And then I'm gonna go ahead and color in her eyes, which is one of my favorite parts. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my ref because I don't really need it anymore. And now I'm going to do her eye shinies and for this I typically go all the way to the top because I want to make sure I'm above the line art layer in case I color over part of her eye that's lined. I'm going to go to shine which is the shiniest mode that I can do here. First I'm going to start with a darker blue color and add extra shine over here to this part of her eye. Her eyes are technically gray, but if they were blue, they'd be a lot more saturated, so. Then I'm gonna add a little bit of like an orange into this part of her eye. Just a tiny bit will do. To further give them some more dimension. Then I'm gonna take like a neon purplish and I'm gonna make this little highlight in her eye here. And then I take my water tool and I just kind of blur the back end of that where the light is wrapping around her pupil. And last but not least, I like to kind of put a reflection of that light down here in this part of her eye and also just a little sparkle, especially for chibis. I like to do this because why not? It's a chibi. <laughs> okay, and then the last thing I'm going to show you quickly is the best way to save your artwork. So I'm going to select just the artwork here itself. I'm going to go to Canvas and Trim Canvas by Selection and that just makes the canvas the right size for the artwork. So as you can see, the canvas I ended up with is a lot smaller than the canvas I started with. Let's go up and see. Canvas size is 1512 by 1820 pixels. So if I wanted to make this like an 11 by 14 print, it probably would look a little bit fuzzy but if I was making it into a small sticker, it would work just fine to print that. So you're gonna wanna make sure you're drawing on a canvas size tailored to what you plan to do with the artwork. If you're gonna make a print that you'd like to make, you know, 18 by 24, <laughs> then you're gonna need to set your canvas to something like six or 7,000 pixels. <laughs> just make it really big, basically. So just always keep that in mind when you're setting up your canvas. Anyway, this is fine for what I'm gonna use it for, which is probably just to send as a gift to my patron. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control Shift S to save as, and we have our Psi2 file here, which is the native file that has all the layers and it's editable. But I'm gonna go ahead and make this a PNG file because that is the best format for artwork with a transparent background and even for artwork that doesn't have a transparent background because it keeps the quality of your original artwork. So I'm gonna save this as mini bean portrait and there we have it. So guys, I hope that was a little bit helpful and maybe you learned some things that you hadn't known before. If there were any questions you had or you'd like me to do a follow-up on any of these points, 
please let me know in a comment down below. I can always improve on my instructional style. I'm pretty new to this. Please consider subscribing and liking the video as it helps my channel grow. Also make sure to leave a win of the week comment in the thread below about what's going well in your life this week. For me, what's going well is my store launch prep. October 1st is coming up pretty quickly, but I'm consistently working on getting things ready and I'm making progress. So I feel like that's a good win. Anyway guys, that's it for this week. I will see you in the next video. Bye everyone.